Let me now welcome um, His Excellency Saif al Hajari, uh, who is Chief Executive of Tawazan, to the panel and to the platform, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be here to share a few thoughts and lessons based on Tawazan's experience and the key challenges experienced in driving industrialization and growth within the context of the UAE today. Talent, the ability to innovate and create strategic alliances plays a major role in defining manufacturing sector contributions in emerging economies such as the UAE. The global manufacturing ecosystem is going through major transformations with many emerging economies developing significant manufacturing and innovation capabilities, enabling them to produce complex products which ultimately result in the globalization of the supply chain. In the UAE, under the guidance of wise leadership, we have long realized that the manufacturing sector cannot be built and flourished without talented, capable, and well-trained UAE nationals. The country's economic diversification policy demands close collaborations and partnerships between academia and the industry locally and internationally. Although a lot has been achieved in the last decade, more work and closer alignment is still required in order to develop the technical manpower required to build these industries. Today, we are all gathered here, leaders from the aviation, aerospace, defense, space, and related industries to share our experiences and build on each other's strength. I'm sure that all of us have similar challenges, ranging from the sourcing of raw materials all the way to having the right infrastructure, machines, equipment, and financial and intellectual capital. In the UAE, however, the real challenge revolves around human capital, even with the best machines raw material, know-how, and other factors in place, our success can only be sustained with the right people on board. Our ultimate success depends on the quality of people who handle and manage the means and the tools of production. Our founding father, late Sheikh Zayed, stated that the real asset of any advanced nation is, is, is its people especially the educated ones. And the prosperity and success of people is measured by the standard of their education. Fortunately, driven by the vision of our leadership, UAE has, since its birth, put in place many mechanisms to build its human capabilities to support the national development and welfare agenda. Our leadership pursued this far-sighted vision, and we in Tawazan adopted this vision and worked under its guidance. We realized early in the game that today's world, the key drivers of success are, are the well-developed and competent Emiratis nationals. This young generation is the foundation of achieving and reserving the knowledge and the innovation acquired. Based on our experience in Tawazan, we realized that building human capital is a complex matter that requires careful analysis and attention. We found that we need to pay attention to, the developing, to, to developing people at different levels and across many disciplines or other areas. In that context, 
we established a full-fledged Tawazan training center at our, uh, at our Tawazan Industrial Park. And we implemented a number of innovative programs to develop our technical and engineering talent at different levels, ranging from vocational and operator level to engineering level, covering different disciplines and specializations. We partnered with Abu Dhabi Tawteen Council, local and international universities, vocational colleges to develop an array of training programs, such as Tawazan Manufacturing Technology and Tawazan Technicians Program, to recruit, train, employ UAE male and female nationals at operator technicians levels. Developing leadership capital is also an important area that we are focusing and aiming to make continuous progress in order to support our leadership requirements. During 2012, we established a unique Master of Business Administration program in collaboration with the UAE University, focusing on manufacturing and industrial excellence. This carefully designed program aims to develop managers who could lead the manufacturing and industrial organizations in the UAE. The program is now open to participants from other industrial organizations and we hope that we will be able to use this MBA as a forum of sharing knowledge and experiences between different industrial entities in the UAE. In order to strengthen the industrial uh, academia collaboration further, Tawazan with the UAE University have established Center of Industrial Leadership in December 2013 in Abu Dhabi. The aim of the center is to bring various players in the industry together, to share thoughts, views and areas of mutual interest. The center will also facilitate the process of young Emirati getting together to share best practices. Additionally, the center is expected to encourage partnerships between various universities, colleges and the industry to incubate concepts and to provide support for those young entrepreneurs who need help with, the, with developing their concepts further. As a result, our technical manpower pipeline today include over 300 technically strong Emiratis ranging from engineers, manufacturing supervisors, as well as technicians of both genders, males and females. I would like to conclude by sharing three key lessons based on our experience. One, collaborative and consortium models need to be in place establishing a consortium to build human capital in key areas like manufacturing and industrial leadership through programs such as UAE Tawazan MBA program bring many benefits. Consortiums and collaboration help us pool both physical and, and, and intellectual resources from all partners and also reduce the risk of cost for all parties involved by sharing the resources and the infrastructure. Furthermore, the sharing of diverse talent, capabilities, and ideas help boost creativity and innovation in learning. Number two, one or two programs are not enough to meet the challenges in the long term. We need to pay equal attention to the human capital challenge at various levels and as well across various disciplines. Many programs and initiatives are needed to address the human capital challenge in a more comprehensive manner. For example, at Tawazan, developing our UAE national operators is equally important as developing our leadership team. We believe that without such strategy, we will not achieve through emiratization. Number three, both quality and quantity of human capital matters. The key to overcome the human capital challenge is to ensure the quality of people development process is not quantity. By just recruiting UAE nationals, one can claim that we have achieved 60 or 70 percent of nationalization. At Tawazan, we are trying to focus equally on quantity of development and the quality to achieve true success. Finally, I would like to reiterate that Tawazan, at Tawazan, sustainable emiratization is one of the core objectives we focus on. We are 
always exploring collaborations and partnership with world-class organization and academia in order to ensure that the best practices are adopted and deployed. We firmly believe that it is through collaboration and value-added partnership that we can achieve our goal of developing a competent, capable, and well-skilled Emirati workforce for the manufacturing sector. I am honored to have had the chance to participate in this esteemed gathering today to share a challenge which I know is common to all of us and to shed light on some simple uh -huh. yet important step we can all take towards building a capabilities of our future generations, our future industries, and most importantly, the future of the UAE. And thank you very much. Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed. Let me now invite um, Marion uh, up to the uh, platform again because we're now going to have two panels about that critical, one of the critical uh, questions on uh, can partnerships and collaboration lead to an increase in returns across the aerospace in industry. So this is the, the first of two panels, and Tony Tyler from IATA and Tony Douglas, Chief Executive of Abu Dhabi Airport's um, company, they will be here between the two panels. Let me uh, keep encouraging you to send thoughts to me because already I've got um, issues like sustainability, partnerships, competition, all of which are critical to this question of partnerships and collaboration leading to an increase in returns across the aerospace industry. Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. And I'd like to ask our panelists to come up, if we could, while I am making a few uh, opening remarks, uh, because we've got a very distinguished group. I am Marion Blakey, the President and CEO of the Aerospace Industries Association of America. And it's a real pleasure to be back in Abu Dhabi, because I must tell you, I was here for the first summit. And it was exciting then, and now the growth and the changes and the way things have matured is tremendously impressive, and it's wonderful to be a part of it. So, I must tell you that this panel, I believe, provides an excellent opportunity to establish some important themes for the next two days of discussion as we consider how partnerships and collaboration can advance the interest of the entire sector. I think it's a timely topic for two reasons. First, as aerospace and defense development budgets tighten around the globe, many companies are seeking out partners where they can help reduce cost, reduce cycle time, drive innovation together. Secondly, as aerospace businesses blossom and the capabilities that go with them blossom around the world, partnerships and collaboration are spreading at an unprecedented rate worldwide. Whereas, I think if you think back on it, a generation or two ago, it would be fair to say that most nations' defense platforms, civil aircraft, space systems, they were all really developed and manufactured within that country's national boundaries. Today, the situation is much different. Major fighter aircraft programs, airplanes, like the 787, the Airbus 380, the International Space Station. Think about the international collaboration there. They are all a product of this much more expansive transnational model. Now, we're very fortunate to have a distinguished panel here to discuss these important topics. Marilyn Hewson, the chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin, Mick Morrow, the president of Sikorsky, Jean Bhatti, 
hear from Airbus, uh, the chief technology officer there, and Randy Tenseth here on the end, the vice president for marketing at Boeing Commercial Aircraft. Since our time is brief and I want you all to hear primarily from our panelists, I won't list their many accomplishments at any length. I think that's available to you in your program. But I would like to highlight the diversity of backgrounds that we have here with this panel. Marilyn Houston, for example, has led four out of five of the major Lockheed business sectors in the course of her career. And I think it's important to know that she started that career as an industrial engineer. Sikorsky's McMorrow served as an officer in the US Navy nuclear submarine program. And in that regard, Mick, I understand you spent one full year of your life underwater. He also performed research at Los Alamos National Lab, which is one of the finest research institutions we have in our country, and taught physics at the US Naval Academy. Dr. Jean Bharti, get this, has 24 patents to his credit and is leading a very exciting Airbus program which is focused on electrical technology for use in aircraft and other air aviation systems. And I think he'll talk to us a little about that. But it's also interesting to know that in his free time, he plays on the Airbus rugby team but if ever you've seen a rugby scrum, you know that he's up for the rough and tumble of aviation <laughs> aircraft competitions. And our final speaker, Randy Tenseth, had began his career at Boeing as a flight test pilot, but he's been responsible for some impressive marketing initiatives as well. The Dreamliner came from his Name Your Plane initiative. It was a promotional contest that had thousands and thousands of entries. And he currently writes a blog called Randy's Journal. And if you haven't tried it, go online and pull up that journal. I find I learn a lot about what's going on in aerospace, and he does it with great humor. Let me start, if I could, Marilyn, with a question to you. Lockheed Martin has been very successful, to say the least, in establishing and executing international partnerships on major defense programs around the world. What would you say are the lessons learned, perhaps, in the course of that? And what would you say particularly about collaborating on aerospace products across a global supply chain? Well, thank you, Mary. And I would say certainly that partnerships are about shared purpose and mutual beneficial arrangements. And so they're even more important in defense. If you think about a shared purpose in, in the defense products and capabilities, and we do business with over 70 countries around the world, that partnership with the country where we do business is critically important because we want to provide the best capability that we can so that they in turn can provide protection for their citizens, national security, essential services for their citizens. And so that first and foremost is important. Moreover, through those defense products that we can provide around the world, it, it offers the opportunity for interoperability. It offers the opportunity for, for countries to work together to build their own uh, shared trust and capabilities and enhance that partner capability. On the, on the mutual beneficial side of it, as we think about what does it do for those economies, Certainly defense trade and, and the ability to do defense manufacturing in a country brings jobs, it brings economic growth, it brings the ability to accelerate technology development in those countries. It moreover gives us an opportunity to work on a pipeline of talent, so to partner with universities as well as with local industry in order to meet those needs. So I think it's a, a real essence of partnership in that sense. A great example of that is the F-16. When you look at the F-16 that is sold to 28 countries around the world, right here in the region, it's 500 F-16s that are across the region. It, it presents the cornerstone of air defense for many countries and is a critical capability. As you heard earlier, we are teamed with Mubadala and Sikorsky in uh, an aviation capability of services that we provide in advanced uh, military maintenance, repair, and overhaul, AMROC. And that center is a place where, as OEMs, as original equipment manufacturers, such as Lockheed Martin for the products that are there, as well as Sikorsky and, and other OEMs, we are able 
to support the ex engineering expertise that's there, the, the talented um, employees in order to provide aviation services for the broad platform of platforms and capabilities uh, for the UAE air services, but in addition to that, for potentially region for countries around the region. So a very good example of partnership where it's not only providing essential capability and national security products, but also creating jobs, economic development, building partner capacity, helping local industries to, to uh, enhance their technology, working with universities to bring on technology development, and that whole range. And that is, is how we go to market around the world. I know that's true for many of our counterparts in the defense industry. Thanks, Marilyn. And in that same vein, I'm going to turn to Mick Morrow because, Mick, I think it is a very interesting partnership that you have set up for Turkey, both in terms of the military aspects of it and in terms of industry by licensing the transfer of manufacturing technology to Turkish industry for the Black Hawk. Maybe you could tell us about the decision-making process, how you came to that, and how you assess the growth of that partnership. Sure, um, and I would, building on uh, what Marilyn said, uh, partnerships are not new to us. Uh, we, we have quite a bit of experience. You heard about the one here in uh, UAE. We do other things with Lockheed, for instance, with our uh, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, uh, with Boeing, with uh, a new high-speed product for, uh, for the Army. Uh, in fact, other divisions of United Technologies with Airbus, so uh, not new to us, but I do think the program in Turkey is, is new for us in terms of how extensive it is and, and a little bit uh, new for Sikorsky in terms of uh, globalization and trying to work with partners outside of the U.S. and maybe outside of the standard uh, world of the OEMs. And uh, it's, a, it's a program uh, for uh, 109 uh, Blackhawks, a, a Turkish version of the Blackhawk. And it isn't a straight, uh, it wasn't like a, a bid type situation. This is something that evolved over years. And we worked closely with the Turkish government on establishing a program that served their customers in the different various armed services, but importantly served their industrial base. And roughly one third of that program, uh, the work is performed by Sikorsky and about two thirds of the program is performed by Turkish industry. Uh, uh, Turkish aerospace, uh, uh, incorporated. Um, a Celson is developing a new uh, cockpit for that aircraft. And then ALP, which is a 50-50 joint venture we have in Turkey, it's been around for more than 10 years, um, is also a big, uh, a big part in that program. And what we did was work together on a program that recognized the capabilities of, of, of Turkish industry and Sikorsky and how we could best work together. And toward that end, uh, are essentially over the next 20 years or so developing a, 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 a complete supply chain for the Black Hawk that will augment the what we have today and uh, that's a win for Turkish industry it's a win uh, it's a win for us in terms of serving our other customers and making the product that much more competitive oh, that's very impressive when you hear about what goes into this uh, let me turn now to Jean Barty here and ask that you tell us a little about your views on innovation. I must say, I found a quote of yours, innovation is to be found everywhere in our day-to-day -day lives, other industries, the arts, music, our day-to-day -day experiences. So let me ask you about a specific aspect of aerospace innovation. There's a growing pressure to be innovative across the entire supply chain. A company of Airbus's scope, how do you do that, especially with the smaller ends of the supply chain? <clears throat> That's a complicated equation because uh, we have uh, more than 350 partnerships in the world uh, and, and that goes from incremental innovation to really disruptive one. Um, <clears throat> And, and um, in the incremental side today, if we look, you know, we have uh, we're already starting to uh, to see. Uh, you, you mentioned that before in, in your speech about robots. You know, mm -hmm. we call them cobots, collaborative robots, and we're going to have one uh, in Spain that is going to start uh, <coughs> in the next weeks. That will be a collaborative robot that, like close to humanoid, you know, that will help to assemble 
parts in the airplanes and another one in France, in Saint-Nazaire, a little bit later on. So you see these things are already happening in, in, in the manufacturing side. Um, we have here, for example, uh, in this uh, country, we're working on composites, you know, and we're looking at next generation of composites in order to make sure that uh, we reduce, you know, the, the complex curing process in the plants. So those are what I called incremental innovations. Disruptive ones uh, are like, you know, our new electric aircraft that uh, we're going to fly officially starting uh, 25th of April. And it's going to be a two and four seater to train pilots, you know, for pilot training. We're not entering into the two seats and four seats aircraft. The idea here is to learn, to learn how to go in towards more electric aircraft for the future. And in order to do that, we're going to do it in a, in a very different way. It means that we're going to use a, a very, um, I would say, high level schools of uh, aeronautics to help us to develop, to design, and build this aircraft. It will be a brand new plant. It will be done as an experiment. And this should help us to not only develop the new technologies of tomorrow, but also to teach our engineers of tomorrow what the future of you know, aeronautics will be. Uh, looking forward to this uh, experience. It's pretty unique. And uh, I think those are the kind of things that we, as Airbus Group, are looking you know, around the world. And for that, obviously, you need to uh, get uh, the best people um, around you. And it's not only a question of us. We are, you know, our base is European. But you have to look at the entire world. Good ideas, good innovations happen everywhere. And they happen here, too. So we're looking at you know, those 350 partnerships to help us you know, to enhance and improve our product for tomorrow. Wow, that's terrific. And you're hitting, of course, on the issue of how we develop a workforce for tomorrow, which in our industry is one of the greatest challenges we have. Now let me turn for a moment, Randy, if I might, to the commercial side of our business. Because the landscape's changing there, and goodness knows Boeing has been driving that. So from the standpoint of developing long-term partnerships with airlines, as well as with lessors and others, Tell us how that is developing from the Boeing vantage point. Well, I think from a Boeing perspective, there are things that we can do directly with our customers to help them and to partner with them. And then there are, I think there's things that we as an industry must do together. So when I look at the partnerships with our airline customers, you know, they're focusing on finding new ways to become more efficient, to find new ways to generate more revenue. And we can do that first and foremost by improving the products we have today and we've been doing that. The second thing that we can do with our customers is bring new products to the market and frankly that's a conversation that sometimes takes years to get the right product. When you get the right product there, then you have a situation where they benefit, they're able to grow their business and we're able to grow our business. Uh, the other thing that we see with our customers today is the emphasis on services. You know, airlines are focusing to do what's core to their business model. And what they don't want to do, they want someone else to do it more efficiently. So what we can do at a company like Boeing is focus on the areas around services that we do best, whether it be using our logistics system or our engineering talent or our intellectual property to find ways to help our customers become more efficient and take things off their plate so they can really focus on their customers, the passengers. And then finally, and we've touched upon this in, in many of the presentations already today, what can we do as an industry to help our customers out? Well, we can find ways to bring biofuels to the market, find ways to become more sustainable, therefore our partnership with Etihad. We can find ways to easier finance airplanes over time. What can we do as an industry to help? And then finally, we all believe that there's better ways to fly aircraft through the air traffic management system. The technology's there. We can put it on the airplanes. We just have to find a way to get the investment to move forward on that. You know, every airplane in the world can become 10% more fuel efficient overnight if we can solve some of these issues around air traffic management. Boy, that is absolutely true and something we need to as a 
global industry really tackle together. Uh, we have a few more minutes, so I think I will ask another quick round of questions, if I might. Uh, and we touched on the workforce and how you develop a strong set of workforce and managers. Uh, Marilyn, when you think about that, how do you spot managers, particularly who are going to be good and effective at managing these broad-ranging partnerships and global collaboration? Well, that's a great question. I, I think talent in any business and any, in any organization is the key to success. We can have great facilities, great labs, great machinery, but it really comes down to the people doing the work. In our business, what we look for are leaders. We identify leaders that have the whole spectrum of, of behaviors that we want to continue to develop and grow. I think as you look at partnerships, the important thing is the ability to build effective relationships, the ability to first and foremost listen to the customer, to our partners that we're working with, to make sure that we have open, transparent communication and we're listening to what they need and, and want and getting to those shared objectives, uh, and then to respond. And you need leaders that get that, that are not just uh, internally focused on what they want to do, but rather they are in a partnering and collaborative uh, capability that they bring forward. So we train around that, we develop around that to help, to help uh, leaders see how important it is that you get to that mutual understanding and, and the shared goals and listen so that you can provide the best capability. Then I would say it's a matter uh, that you make sure that we have the kind of uh, commitment to meet our commitments and that, that you create a relationship where you're trusted. I mean, each and every one of us has to perform on what we commit to do, but it's following through on our commitments is what builds the trust and the confidence in our partners uh, that we're going to come through with what we committed to do. Mm -hmm. Mick, Marilyn was elaborating on what makes successful managers and leaders. Going a little broader, what would you say Sikorsky has found are the successful ingredients, the important ingredients from the standpoint of partnerships globally? Well, I think um, first and foremost, I would say ethics and integrity, and, mm. and really a, a, a cultural fit with us uh, so that we can work together long term. Uh, it's not a transactional thing about a, you know, the next project. You're going to be working together typically for decades. And so I would say that, that would be number one. Number two would be a, a focus on, on a quality mindset. And uh, if I have a, a couple of recent examples of successes, in my view, uh, for us in, in Poland, uh, we had uh, very good success with a company that, that we worked with and acquired there, uh, Pizadel Mielitz, where we're now uh, assembling Blackhawk cabins and, and, and entire Blackhawks there, uh, where we've seen a great cultural fit, great attention to detail, and, uh, and, and focus on quality and an ability to frankly teach us as much as we teach them from an engineering and, and a manufacturing standpoint. And, and I would say we've had similar success uh, in India with our partner Tata, where uh, the, again, they have lots of experience in manufacturing, not quite so much in aerospace, uh, but putting the two of us together has, has worked quite well. That's good. Uh, Sean, when you think about it, um, it's got to be difficult to find great partners and some of the best and brightest minds when you're looking at it on a global scale. How is it that Airbus goes out and finds likely partners, particularly, you know, in areas that you're just beginning to work in? I, I don't think it's difficult, no. you know. As I said, we have more than 350 partnerships. Yeah. Yesterday, I was visiting two top universities here, you know, Mazdar and Khalifa, and uh, I was again, impressed on the things that you can find around the world. The most difficult thing is to prioritize in this, to select in the institutions what are work on their strength. You know, and you, that the, um, requires time. You have to spend time, uh, time to discuss with uh, the top universities or wherever we are in the world to find where are the strong spots you can work with them on. And, and for me, this is the biggest job we have to do. Uh, we're organized in, uh, in Airbus Group in such a way that I'm chairing a, a committee 
which is called the Engineering Technical Council. And we meet every two months. And those are the things that we discuss. You know, we are mapping the world and we look at, okay, for this and this and this need, where can we find the resources and the strengths? And one other difficulty that we have is that sometimes the business aspect and the, the technology requests are maybe different. In other words, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, businesses around the world, as Boeing does. We sell a lot of airplanes. People today, not only they want you to come and build a plant, they want also that you open to them the possibility to do research and technology because they know that innovation is key for the future. And there, you know, the most difficult thing is to be able to balance this, you know, these two things. And, and uh, that's where my, I would say, most of my job is, is to make sure that I, I use at best the partnerships that we have around the world, just 350 partnerships. And Randy, thinking about this again, a little bit from the commercial side, um, can you talk about how Boeing makes investment decisions in terms of the uh, supplier base? You've got a very far-flung supplier base. What would you say are lessons learned on that? Yes, when it comes to suppliers and our supplier base, you know, each and every year we spend 35 billion U.S. dollars with parts and assemblies from our suppliers from 5,400 different factories around the world. Mm. And when you think about our business, 80% of the airplanes we deliver, deliver to airlines outside of the United States. So it's all about being international. And when we look at our supply base, we have to have a supply base that really reflects where our customers are. We have to have a supply base that brings us the best in terms of technology, the best in terms of, of intellectual uh, property, uh, the best in terms of quality, price, and delivery. And I think what we've been able to build here with Mubadala is a great example of that. I mean, we have a need for high technology composite parts just as, as Airbus does. They have a willingness, they have the capital, they have the desire to build those parts. Uh, what w what uh, we bring to the table is an opportunity to, for them to diversify, for them to um, create jobs. And you know, this is a growth business. I think you talked about it a little bit later, I mean a little bit earlier. You know, this is a marketplace that's going to grow about 5% per year. So you establish those jobs, those jobs will just grow over time. So this is a great industry to invest in. We believe in the industry, you pick the right partners, you all grow profitably together. I think we have just a couple more minutes here, so I would throw a question out to the whole panel and see what you all think on this. We're talking about partnerships, some of which can really be measured in pure economic terms. But there also has got to be a political dimension that you have to be able to gauge and think about what kind of success are we expecting and what may be signs that that is going to be too challenging in some circumstances. So I would simply ask, talk about how you measure success from both vantage points, if you would. Well, I would say it does go back to shared goals, shared objectives. I mean, that in any partnership is important, whether it is at, at a country level or at, at your local industry level or at universities or any of those. I mean, you have to establish that up front because that's what's going to drive it being very, a very successful partnership or not. So, for example, if you're looking at innovation, as you've talked quite a bit about, how do you collectively get together and say, is it the, is it the product that you're trying to come up with or is it the development of the, of the uh, students and others that can take it forward so that you can accelerate beyond that specific technology development? Similarly with local industry, you want to draw on their innovation and their capabilities, but at the same time you want to take them to a new level of capability so that once that project's done, they can expand it into other areas. So I think at it, it, it each case, it's got to be a shared purpose and then something that's mutually beneficial to take it forward. No, that makes sense. Uh, let me ask one other question before we close. All of the success that we're talking about here and projecting, of course, depends on a successful airspace system and the ability to have 
a robust increase in air traffic all over the world. And it's an area that there really are global challenges. I'd be interested in how you all think, as original equipment manufacturers, how can you all work with others on a global basis to address this? Because it's, it's a genuine and increasing problem. Well, I guess I would look at it this way. The first thing that we've had to do is work with our supplier partners to make sure that the technology is on the aircraft. That's, that's critical. And, and frankly, the technology's been on the aircraft now for a number of years. Then it really comes down, and here's this, the, the frustration or the struggle, that so many of these systems are being done on a piecemeal basis from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The technologies aren't necessarily all aligned. But frankly, I think the recipe is the same. You know, pick, pick your partners, use every piece of leverage that you have in the marketplace, the airline customers, the airports, the communities that are supported by aviation, and frankly, you have to work the political system really, really hard. And you also have to know that it's going to take a long, long time to be successful. I just wish we could figure out a way to make it uh, that that benefit is better understood and we can reduce that timeline. One way also to, uh, to look at this is to simplify the, the, the life uh, of our suppliers. You know, uh, I know Boeing has got, for example, Exostar. We've, we started Boost Aerospace. Those are things that, you know, we're trying to get uh, our suppliers to, to speak the same language for ours because otherwise it's extremely difficult for them when you have five CAT system to go through, when you have different ways of getting procurement. And, 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 and it's important that we simplify all this to make the life of you know, small suppliers easier to access the world of Airbus or Boeing. And I think those are important things too. You know, uh, try to simplify the way you, know, you, you interface with your suppliers. And this is, this is a big, in my opinion, a, a big thing to do for the future. Well, any other advice from our panel on how to make these partnerships uh, flourish before we wrap up here? All right. Well, with that in mind, I think that we will turn this back over to you, Nick, and we appreciate the opportunity to share what I have to say are experiences from some very, very successful players in our overall industry. So thank you all for being here.